Good afternoon and welcome to our UC Davis Health panel discussion for the new documentary, Fast Forward. I'm, I'm pleased that you could spend the next hour with us as we reflect on the movie, hear from its director and a cast member, as well as learn about the themes reflected in the film that are being addressed here at UC Davis Health. We'll begin with a moderated discussion with our special guests, then open it up for questions for those of you today. We are joined by film director Michael Eric Hurdick, cast member Abe Barrientos, Carrie Harvath, who is director for the Family Caregiving Institute at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis, and Katrin Tyler of the UC Davis School of Medicine, who serves as Senior Emergency Care Unit at UC Davis Medical Center. I encourage you throughout our discussion to please, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. We are going to leave some time at the end so that you can get um, any of your burning questions answered by our panel. Of course, I hope by now you have seen the documentary. Fast those four families where millennials and boomers experience age in a new way. It's an immersive journey into their futures from the aging empathy bodysuit to very realistic special effects makeup. These fathers and sons, mothers and daughters grapple with how they feel and how they look. And the reality that by 2045, the average American will live to the age of 85. Are we ready to grow older? Have you planned for your life as an older adult? As the film asks, if you knew now what you'll know then, would you change anything? Visionary behind that question and the film is director Michael Eric Hurdick, and he joins us now. Michael Eric, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to join the group today. Well, I know you've created what you call an immersive experience for your documentary subjects. Can you talk about that format for the film? Well, I think as we developed uh, developed this film and we thought about the ways in which we could uh, talk about uh, aging in new ways. You know, I am a uh, uh, younger uh, filmmaker. I'm in my late 30s. And uh, a lot of the material, firstly, a lot of the material that we saw out there while beautifully made was in some instances difficult to watch. It showed uh, some, some perhaps related to uh, policy, or different issues or telling touching uh, first person stories. Um, however, uh, because of the hurdle that a lot of people have to think about their own aging, perhaps about the, the country aging and all of these issues, aging being so complex, we wanted to take an approach that would connect more so with broad audiences, with intergenerational audiences and younger audiences as well. And we thought that by uh, creating these immersive experiences, we could help people uh, into this reality and help them uh, face some of these questions they may or may not have been asking themselves in, uh, less, in less figuratively and, and really to send them somewhere where they could really realize this the, for themselves. And in addition, it was just really important uh, that we uh, give them a full 360 degree experience. And uh, part of that also made the film uh, uh, fun. You know, the aging suit is something fun to watch. Uh, Hollywood style makeup is fun to watch in any context. Um, but I think it just hopefully is helping, I think it helped our participants uh, and hopefully it's helping audiences to get over some of these hurdles that uh, a lot of us have when thinking about the future and thinking about ourselves as older adults. I found myself a little bit envious to see what would it be like to feel 30 years older? I don't know about the makeup. I, I, I don't think I'm ready for that yet. But I'm curious, um, your personal experiences with maybe aging relatives, did that weigh into your choice of, of this topic for a film? Well, really, uh, to be honest, I'm a filmmaker uh, that has always been really fascinated by time travel and this idea that you can uh, travel into another time, whether it be the future or the past, get some kind of special knowledge and bring it back into your life and, and just be transformed. Um, 
And in thinking about my own aging, thinking about my family as aging, um, there are a lot of unknowns out there. And so for myself, this was an exploration of uh, the unknown as opposed to the known. It wasn't the result of an experience that has already happened, but instead asking that question, what might it be like? Which is really, uh, I, I think even those who have been through the film, it's really hard to pose ourselves these questions. It's hard to see into that future. And you didn't need a DeLorean to do your time travel in this. No, <laughs> as you can see behind me, we just needed a bicycle. I know, I love it. Now, you and I got connected first through um, a, a fellow funder, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. I want to give a shout out to those from the Moore Foundation joining us today. Um, they are near and dear to our hearts at UC Davis Health and the Betty I. Reed Moore School of Nursing and the Family Caregiving Institute. Um, they, along with the John A. Hartford Foundation, were underwriters of this work. Um, so they are work in the aging space. I'm curious, as you started to uncover all the different efforts that you consulted and that we saw in the film from AARP and the Conversation Project and, and several others, um, what did you learn um, about maybe the common denominators or um, different things about the, the groups that are working in this healthy aging space? Well, you know, that... That uh, makes me think of uh, how, how many common denominators there are in the film, as you see in the film, and how many stories are so different. One of the really interesting things was to see all of these different experts coming at aging from vastly different perspectives. You know, Dr. Coughlin with MIT Age Lab is seeking to create, uh, you know, help create a world where our infrastructure and our products and all these things are much more age friendly, a world that we can all live in together um, in a more progressive way. Um, whereas others are, uh, were seeking to make sure that families could connect, you know, if we're talking about the conversation project, um, the human element of making that connection between uh, uh, loved ones and being able to have these conversations. But one of the really uh, fascinating things that that we we haven't talked about and we haven't it's not in the film it's the stories of each of these experts in the film and and yourselves and and hopefully and likely everybody uh, here with us now is everybody's vastly different story for their reason for getting into this space and seeking to make uh, care for older adults better or whatever their their goal is um, and all of these different trajectories. I think Leo puts it uh, best in, at the end of the film when he says, you know, wow, I discovered there was this whole network of people working together and they may not be in working directly together as they do at the geriatric unit in, uh, in Boise, Idaho. Um, but uh, uh, it's an amazing uh, uh, support system that, uh, that I hope the film helps bring to light and, and can help you know, activate people in communities uh, around the country. So I have to ask your participants went to their aging boot camp. How did they do? I mean, did they pass it? Um, I think it's interesting because everybody took a different uh, uh, touch point from their 360 degree, their immersive experience. And they said, well, this really has made an impact on me and I'm going to make this change in my life. You know, uh, and uh, Abe can speak to this. Um, but uh, it was very powerful to hear from them when we caught up with them that they've been using music therapy with Carmen, uh, Leo's grandmother, uh, following the production. But everybody went through, we only saw two of Abe and Leo's experiences in the film, uh, two or three, and everybody was really spent a week having these experiences. And so everybody took took a piece for themselves and uh, and their, their aging bootcamp story resonated with them in different ways. And one of the things that's on our, on our Fast Forward movie website is uh, a fun little survey uh, asking what kind of ager people are, which is just soft science. It's more for fun to think about our different approaches to aging. And I think everybody passed in the sense that they got a better sense of how they wanted to approach aging because there is no right solution and there is no full, full plan. You know. 
Well, I want to bring Abe in. Um, Abe is joining us today. As you mentioned, he and his son Leo were, were featured and we, we met Abuela as well. Um, Abe is in the Portland area. We also heard, Abe, you're a bit of a risk taker. When you had to do that, yeah, yes, I, all of all of <laughs> and, and, and I think that's pretty much my downfall, you know? <laughs> I, I kind of tend to go off tangent. <laughs> from the experience ah uh, gosh you know what um now that i look back it's like you know aging just kind of sneaks up on you you know it, it, it's like you know life moves along and before you know it it's just staring at you and uh whether you're prepared or not and um you know i i, I try to stay active you know i, I run I, I do all sorts of outdoor activities but uh, i'm starting to feel it <laughs> And every morning when I look at myself in the mirror, you know, I'm looking, oh, oh that's something new. <laughs> so. And that's not the makeup, right? <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. It's not. But, uh, you, you know, I, I think, um, you know, through the course of life, you know, you just do, you know, you just move on. But then all of a sudden it's just like, whoa, I've, I've, I've gotten old. And, you know, my wife and I talk about that because now we have grandkids and we see them as like, wow, we're like, uh, we're really old. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's, that, that's, that's the biggest takeaway. I, it's like you, you don't realize it, but then it's going to happen. But you really have to prepare for it. Well, you really are in that, in that sandwich generation where you mentioned you've got grandkids, but you're also taking care of your mother-in-law. Um, there was an incredibly powerful moment in the film. Um, every time I've watched it, I cry. Um, but that was with the, the music and memory when she yeah. tapped in and started singing and you started. Um, can you, your experience both with, with in that segment and then just the fast forward experience, has that changed the way that you and your wife care for her or how you view um, her aging process? Yeah, it definitely has. Um, we're, I think we're a lot more intentional and a lot more gracious because, you know, you, you live with the same people every day and you, it's like, eh, you know, they, they can li li live with that. And it's no big deal. But um, we always try to make sure that she's comfortable and safe, right? And what has triggered was that music when we, you know, when that happened, we started incorporating music in our household. And there's uh, a certain tenderness just to see mom change when she hears music from her past. Um, there's a certain sweetness, you know, just to see her enjoy it. And there's also some sadness to it too. But uh, for the most part, I, I think, you know, it really triggers good memories for her. And she becomes like a totally different person. You know, she's alive and, you know, her ordinary self is <laughs> like coming back and she just like, you know, wants to have fun. So uh, yeah, it's, it's like, uh, you know, it was fascinating. I was really, really, you know, like glad that that kind of played into whole, this whole thing with, uh, with the filming, so yeah. Well, it's interesting looking at all of you were going fast forward in time, but in that instance, you went back in time and tapped into those memories yeah. that were yep. still very much um, part of her. And, and family dynamics and caregiving were clearly a theme throughout. So I want to bring in Terry Harvath now. Dr. Harvath at the top is director of the Family Caregiving Institute um, at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing and the current president of the Gerontological Society of America. Dr. Harvath, what stood out to you as to how caregiving was portrayed in the film and its role and importance? Um, the things that, that stood out, first, let me just say, I think that the, this uh, film touched on so many important topics for all of us to be paying attention to. And with regard to family caregiving, um, I think it was interesting to look at how the parents in the situation sort of minimize the need that they might have or that it would be far off in the future where, when help was necessary. And what I saw with the adult children was really a desire to influence their parents' aging in part out of, I think, uh, a recognition of what they may be facing, but also, 
you know, uh, uh, that dynamic of who knows what my parent is going to need. Do they know what they're going to need or do I know what is best for them? And you start to see the dynamic shift with adult children and their parents about who's caring for whom and who's telling them the other person what they should be doing. And, and that can often be a source of tension in, in families when caregiving is happening because um, most of us, as we age, we don't lose the desire for our independence and our autonomy. And when somebody starts to tell us what we should be doing, um, it can, we can be a little bit abrasive. Dr. Harvath, how has the pandemic changed the, the role of caregivers um, other than adding a lot of stress um, to their role? Yeah, I think uh, the pandemic has highlighted just how much families do to care for older adults in our country. And I think it has also shown a spotlight really on ageism, that it's one of those isms that's still very prevalent and really allowed um, and tolerated. And you know, if you look at greeting cards in, in any store, you'll see them always making fun of getting older in ways that we don't do that with other of the isms, if you will. I think it also demonstrated that hospitals and health systems are not very attuned to the critical role that families play in caring for older adults. You know, when the pandemic hit, visitors were banned from hospitals, but exceptions were made for parents of minor children and partners of pregnant women, which are appropriate exceptions to make. We know that the presence of parents and partners um, add to the well-being and the positive outcomes, but that's also true for frail older adults, and caregivers were not made an exception in that policy. And hopefully we're going to move into uh, an era because of films like Fast Forward that sensitize us to that, that we need to recognize that what matters to older adults is important for us to pay attention to. And often it's the family caregiver who is the best person to speak to what matters. Michael, Eric, I know uh, clearly you, you, you shot the documentary pre-COVID. Um, how has uh, the pandemic changed the way you view caregiving and, and aging? Well, I think as we see in the film, uh, all of these, the, I, I suppose we shot this in 20, late 2018, and all of our families, we took to these clinics, we took to these caregiver training seminars, and the key thing that we were showing them was how they will be able to care for one another together. And with the pandemic, then we, f we found this incredible isolation and the loss of, you know, as I talked to uh, Dr. Joseph Coughlin, director of the MIT Age Lab, about the future of care, um, we talked about the high-tech innovations to come, but he also talked about the role of high touch and how important it is to have that, that closeness. And uh, uh, hopefully things are, are starting to repair now, but there was this loss of, uh, of togetherness and this loss of closeness and high touch that's so central to the caregiving and the, all the caregiving that we see and the potential caregiving that we see in the film. Um, so that's what it, that, that's what it makes me uh, think of uh, in this new context. And hopefully, as I said, uh, we'll be able to uh, uh, repair that in the, next, in the next few months as we move along forward, come back together. How, how did the pandemic change the way that, um, that, that you are caring uh, for Abuela? Am I back? You're back. Um, you know, it, it's, it's actually been a challenge. It's been difficult because um, uh, just because of the isolation and not being able to do certain things that we would normally do with her, um, we actually signed her up for this province elder care program. It's elder in place, right? And uh, it's really a good program because uh, they normally would have activities outside and uh, care 
give her people would come in, give us some, you know, some respite or, you know, walk her outside, you know, those different things. But because uh, of the pandemic, you know, there's been a shortage and they pretty much shut down most of those activities because of what's going on right now. But, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to manage, you know, we'll eventually, you know, navigate through what goes on. But uh, like I said earlier, you know, we try to make it as uh, comfortable for her and safe and, you know, just make it a fun day every day for her. Well, I, I was shocked when one of the experts in the film said that social isolation is like smoking a pack a day of cigarettes, um, which that one, that one really hit me. I, I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Um, we're talking about, earlier we talked about, uh, I think you, Dr. Harvath, you brought up, uh, if we're choosing what we think is best for our aging parents or what they would like. And it's that matters piece, which is uh, very important. It's, it's actually one of the four M's that is emphasized by the age-friendly health system initiative, also an effort by the John A. Hartford Foundation. Dr. Katrin Tyler leads that effort. She is the Senior Emergency Care Unit at UC Davis Medical Center. Um, Dr. Tyler, can you explain what you're doing in the ED around these four M's and what the four M's are? Yeah, I'd be, firstly, I'm just so thrilled to be here today and thank you so much for making this amazing film. Michael, Eric, it's really great. And Abe, I'm so glad that you can also be here. It was really, moving experience um, to watch it. So the four M's are mobility and really not just fall prevention, which is a lot of what health systems have focused on um, previously. So uh, mobility is really about keeping active and being sort of your best and most active person. Your mentation, how do we really optimize, you know, uh, have our very best mentation that we can. Medications, you know, how do we minimize the side effects of medications and you know, reduce the number of medications if they're not serving a definite purpose. And really, I, I sort of think the crown jewels of the four M's are the what matters, because that is the, the whole process, the question that makes everything so patient-centered. If you start with that, then it's really hard to go wrong. And I think it is very easy um, at to when you're dealing with an older person, especially somebody who is not as strong or as powerful as they were, you know, several decades ago, it's just, it, it does get a little paternalistic and it's very easy to make decisions on their part. And Terry, I know that you also love this quote from Atul Gawande's book, um, Being Mortal, um, in that we want autonomy for ourselves and safety for our loved ones. And I think anybody who's had ever worked at all in any kind of aging initiative recognizes that. Um, in emergency medicine, you know, our patients come in, often it's a, it's a terrible day when you, when you end up in the emergency department. And um, that, that, near, that sort of desire to shield people can sort of be a little bit overwhelming for relatives. Um, so, um, you know, we're trying to really take into account what matters to people. Um, and we're focusing at the moment on a select group of patients that we are, are really trying to get home. Um, and so we're, you know, optimizing um, their um, process, both in the emergency department and helping them connect um, with resources in the community and um, getting them sort of out and about as safely as possible. So your work is being very intentional about preparing and planning ahead for when these folks do, because as you mentioned, it's a bad day and it's an emergency. So things are moving quickly. So mm -hmm. this working toward this designation, you're building the processes that take into account these four M's? Correct. So we have a lot of extra stuff um, now that we didn't have before. And you know, there's also a general increased awareness in all of our emergency um, department staff that work with older adults. So it's part of the UC Davis Health Healthy Aging Initiative. What is the big picture vision of this initiative for the health system? Well, really at its heart is that we're really turning the focus from the health system to the patient. I mean, it sort of sounds obvious, but anybody who's worked in healthcare knows that health systems are so big 
um, and so complicated now that it's really hard to put the patient at the center, which sounds bonkers, but there we are. So really the aging initiative is, is our attempt. And I think that we will ultimately be successful in really turning the focus back to what the patient wants and needs um, and then by extension, what their family want and need. So it's, it's getting better access to care. It's care that's integrated and coordinated and that it's really focused on improving the quality of life for patients. And hopefully it's, it's helping those so they do not get to the emergency department, right? We want to keep people healthy out of the emergency department. Right. And that's where one of the initiatives that Dr. Harbath is working on comes in in the primary care arena. Um, the new healthy clinic in Midtown Sacramento. How does this clinic contribute to the initiative? Um, well, we're building the clinic around those four M's as well, looking at when we first meet older patients, trying to discern from them what matters to them in life, not just what matters in, in today during this visit, and what do you hope happens, but really what are the kinds of things that contribute to quality of life that if you are no longer able to have that or participate your life would be diminished in some way or the quality would be diminished in some way. And usually our patients are accompanied by the family caregiver and it's really important for the caregiver to hear that as well. We also, of course, are focusing on medications, making sure that they are, older adults are on the right medications, that they're not on ones that, um, as Dr. Tyler said, uh, are not serving them well. We're looking at developing a mobility clinic where we can do additional assessments of older adults and make recommendations about how they can either enhance or maintain the mobility um, that they have. We're also going to be developing an advanced care planning uh, clinical so that we can take a, um, a clinic so that we can take a look at and encourage families to have these uh, conversations. Abe, when you were talking and, and admitting that you're a bit of a risk taker, my hope would be one of the conversations that you have with your son is how much risk do you want him to take on in service to your quality of life? Because as Dr. Tyler said, he's going to want to and feel obligated to protect you. And often when we implement protection, that is a restriction of the kinds of things that give each of us quality of life. All of us takes, take risks in order to enhance our quality. You know, there, there are motorcyclists in California that you know, ride down the white line and without a helmet. And I think those are you know, unnecessary risks, but obviously that's not how they feel. And so recognizing and having that discussion about how much do you want to be let free to engage in behaviors that he may think should be curtailed because of uh, the risk they impose? So, so I think for us, the four M's are starting points of conversations with um, the the different uh, with the patients that we're seeing and with their caregivers, so that we're all. Uh, working in towards the same goals to enhance quality of life for, for our older patients. I have a comment. Oh yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kind of toned down though. So I, <laughs> I, I try to try to listen to, you know, um, wisdom. So I, I, I keep telling my son that, well, you already know what my wishes are and, you know, we'll keep continue to talk about it as, you know, time moves on. So, <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I've toned down a little bit. <laughs> well, let me ask you, you visited one of these interprofessional clinics as, as in the film. Um, what did you think about that approach to care? Were there a bunch of different professionals from different disciplines all kind of centered around you? Was that something that you had experienced before or was that new for you? No, no, that was, that was really new. I was totally shocked that it's a, like a different world out there, right? Um, because I had little, I, I take care of my mom, but my wife really has all the nuts and bolts behind the scenes. Um, but when we went to this, this, those different places, I was, I, I was really impressed that there's a network out there that you, if you know how to navigate through it and find ways of 
you know, connect them together in seeking the help that you need. Um, you know, that's what we're starting to do with mom. That's why we got her into this, uh, you know, um, uh, elder place care with uh, Providence Hospital. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been a benefit. I mean, watching, watching this, the, the film again and going back, I'm going, wow, we learned some things through this, right? <laughs> so <laughs> that, that was a plus. Because you can't do it alone, can you? No, no, you can't. Uh, it's uh, like, like you know, it's a cliche. It takes a village, right? You know, you 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 need you need as much support as you can. Because sometimes, even immediate family, you know, um, they're not they don't understand because they're not in the midst of it or you know in the forefront. But with my wife and I and my son, you know, we're we're kind of in the mix, so we have a better understanding on what the next steps would be. You know, that support, um, let me ask you, Dr. Harvath, in the Healthy Aging Health, you are actually providing caregiver consultation. Um, so helping people find that network that Abe mentioned, mm -hmm. all those support services, is, is that part of your role in those consultations? Yes, it, it is, with the caveat that, um, you know, I think Abe alluded to earlier that a lot of these services are on hold or have been curtailed dramatically with the pandemic. But um, hopefully as the vaccine continues to roll out and we open up more, those services will be available to family caregivers because it takes a tremendous toll. We know that... Um, Caregiving is difficult, it's stressful, it has um, the potential to have a negative impact on a caregiver's physical and mental health and well being. And if we can provide support to them or help them activate a support network among family, friends, and neighbors, they will do better. If they, you know, it, it it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And, you know, when somebody's preparing for a marathon, they often have a team of people who are gonna be along the way to help cheer them on and offer them uh, support. There are stations to get, uh, you know, water and to renew and caregivers need that as well when they're in the marathon of providing care to a, a family member. Well, and part of that race, since that's the analogy you did, was having those difficult conversations. We saw it happen in the film of making plans, the not only what if, but just when. Um, mm -hmm. Abe, I'm curious, since the film forced you to have some of those conversations, um, is Leo at, at a more peace of mind now, um, knowing what your wishes are and and, and things that you would like to see later in life, or is that still a, that's ongoing? I, I think um, he, he, he's more at peace, but he knows that, um, you know, there's still going to be some adjustments and some changes. Um, you know, we're, we're just being realistic here because uh, he knows I'm, I'm fairly good health and I, you know, try to stay active, but uh, anything can happen. I could be, you know, get impaired or impaled or get hit outside. But uh, yeah, he's, I, I think he's come to that, uh, you know, conclusion that, okay, dad, you know, I, I think we know what needs to happen here. And uh, we're gonna revisit, you know, what the next steps would be later on. Um, Cause uh, he knows I'm also busy with mom and just the whole dynamics. But in his mind, he's, uh, you know, he, he knows exactly what he needs to do, so. Dr. Tyler, what happens when you're, uh, just from your ED experience, when it's time to make those uh, decisions and families haven't had the conversations? Yeah. So, um, you know, going back to patient-centeredness again, um, we see a lot of families really, really struggle when they haven't had those conversations. And a absolute shout out to you, like the... The journey of those conversations is really the important part. I think a lot of people feel like it's sort of one conversation to be one and done and sort of dreaded. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, that um, when in reality, it's really, a, really, it is a journey, it's a process. And so, <laughs> I mean, so because I've been 
a doctor for a long time and I was, um, you know, one of my early clinical experiences was actually seeing a, actually quite a young person who had a, a, um, a brain hemorrhage right out of the blue and, um, you know, watching her family, but they'd already decided that if something like this happened, that she wanted to be an organ donor. And so they had already had some components of that, um, what happens if I don't make it um, or if my life isn't what I want it to be conversation, which was just really powerful. So I was like 26 years old talking to my parents about what I, what they, you know, and so, <laughs> so every few years I tell them what I want or, and my husband is also an emergency physician. So we sort of have these quite morbid conversations with monotonous regularity about, um, but I think it, when I see people in the emergency department who haven't even thought that their 85 year old, 90 year old, 95 year old parent might be vulnerable to some rapid change, it's really, it's just very, very stressful for them. And it, it's fascinating to me that as a society in basically a century, we've sort of forgotten that people die, you know, that this is really part of the cycle of, of life. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes that cycle comes, you know, head on into the emergency department. So I, I would say abandon perfection <laughs> um, about what that conversation should look like and just start having it. Um, and I think, you know, really people sometimes think that they have to be all seated in, seated in the same place. But I actually think that there's a power in a gentle walk outside, you know, having some of those difficult conversations can be um, powerful, you know. And just one other thing is that, you know, when families come to us, they often want us to turn that, you know, to turn back the clock. Well, I can't make your 80 year old parent 50 years old. And sometimes I can't even turn back the clock two weeks. And if it's been some really big medical event, sometimes I can't even turn back the clock two hours. Um, and so, you know, sometimes, you know, there's all different kinds of ways that we die. Um, sometimes we die over 15 years, sometimes we die over 15 minutes and, you know, we'll do our best always and we will definitely uh, keep what the patient wants in mind, but it's so helpful um, if the families already know um, what their loved one would want more or less in those situations. It really, it really provides a piece to them, I think, to be knowing that they're making the decision from the patient's perspective. Michael, I'd like to oh, can I jump in yeah. a little bit. Um, I really want to echo what Katrin is saying. And I think sometimes the conversation is easier to ease into when you're not facing a serious illness, uh, because you're suddenly in that situation making decisions about what may or may not not happen for you or for someone you care for. And so having them in the hypothetical but also having conversations about what constitutes quality of life for you. And those are important as well, because you, know, you can have a list of advanced directives and you want hydration or you don't want ventilation, you want somebody to pound on your chest, you don't, but those are not where the, the difficult decisions actually end up happening. And they are much more nuanced and complex. And it's much easier for families and for the health providers to engage in decision-making when we have a sense about what constitutes quality of life. What are the things, you know, for me, it's being able to have meaningful interactions with other people. And if I'm no longer able to do that, I don't want you to keep me alive any longer. And I've had these conversations with my daughter. I've had these conversations with my parents. And when my dad was becoming terminally ill, we'd had so many of these conversations over the years. I'd say, well, here's another hypothetical situation. What if, and um, my mom and I had a really clear sense of what he did and didn't want at the end of his life. And it was a lot easier for us to make some of those difficult decisions for him than I think they would have been if we didn't have any inkling of, of what he wanted or what was important to him. So early and often, I agree with Katrin, it one and done is not going to do it. You need to 
keep revisiting these issues. Michael, Eric, was that one of your hopes in, you know, in making this film that starting the conversation and bringing kind of take some of that stress and complication out of, of families uh, who inevitably we all face aging? Yeah, I mean, my hope was that viewers uh, could uh, be propelled into their own little time travel experiments, mental time travel experiments to get to, even if they're just circling around these conversations, these conversations are the central, most important part of it. But I think there's so many other ideas and so many other considerations as well. And some of them are, are lighter, some of them are harder to talk about. And I think just even opening the door to having that taboo conversation was is just the, the primary goal of this because we realized there was there's so much fear uh, in, in having these conversations. And I know for myself, uh, having sh shared these experiences with uh, the participants in the film in my own family, it became like talking about what you wanted to have for lunch, um, which is actually sometimes a hard question to answer. <laughs> but um, uh, no, I, I joke, but, uh, but it really just made it uh, so much easier. We're not in a crisis scenario in my family. My parents are not in a crisis scenario uh, right now. It would be that much harder. And um, it just made it so much simpler. And it sort of uh, begs, then you beg the question, you know, wh why was I, why weren't we having this conversation? This is such a, it's important. It's not, it's not the toughest thing it needn't be. So uh, yeah, an interesting journey for myself in there as well. And that is, I hope the first, if people only took one thing away uh, from the film, it would be to do that, do just that. Well, it's encouraging that the conversation gets easier the more you do it, uh, like good flexing of a muscle. Um, I will say that there, the if you go to movie.com, there are incredible resources um, that Michael Eric and the team have put together um, to start some of those conversations. If you don't know where to start or you're you're nervous about it, um, I would say start at fastforwardmovie.com um, to go through and get help. Uh, next week, April 16th is National Healthcare Decisions Day, which is another day when we call attention to having the conversations so that um, your loved ones can know what your decisions are um, so that you can keep the dignity um, and that your wishes are met. Um, so um, I, we, questions. I wanna go and take a few questions, encourage those of you watching, if you have a question for the panel, um, or you could just even ask Abe, what exactly was his range of motion wearing that crazy suit? Mm -hmm. um, that That's on the table too, but let's talk I, I, here. I have one other other thing that should be included in your conversation about aging, and that's driving. Mm -hmm. um, because especially, um, you know, if you are living in a place that does not have ready access to public transport, then your independence is really framed by your ability to drive somewhere. Um, and, uh, you know, that can be a really tough conversation for people to have. So, um, even more than what happens if you have a, a cardiac arrest, it's really important to um, start, you know, thinking about how, what is, you know, and I think especially, um, you know, when Susan was thinking about living in the trailer, um, you know, that like she, I, you could really see her sort of processing all of the, well, if I'm living here, then what does my life look like? Um, and I think starting to have those kind of thoughts of, Hey, I'm fine now, but maybe I want to move somewhere that will facilitate my mobility and independence in a way that um, doesn't require me being able to drive a car. Um, and um, just as sort of a, a side note from my own family, my mother also had very bad dementia. And my father actually sort of kept wanting her to do all these things and he kept wanting her to drive, and um, which I thought was a nightmare. <laughs> but, she was still okay at the time. And then he actually was involved in a fender bender. It wasn't his fault, but the car was ruined. And so they had to get a new car. And she actually somehow had enough insight to say, I'm not going to be able to learn to drive this new car. 
and she just gave up her keys right there. And he was so really mad. Took care of itself. Right. But he was, yeah. but the, the, the dynamics of it was that he was remained very mad at her for some time because he felt like she was giving up. And if they'd had that conversation a little bit more, it might've been different, so. Uh, well, let, let me get to one of our, our, um, our viewers. Um, and this has to deal with um, approaching conversations with family members who are resistant um, or a bit in denial about the fact that dementia is progressive. Um, so the question is, um, uh, it's hard to get the family on the same page. Everyone's tied up in the day-to-day, -day, don't really wanna have the conversation that the, the dementia is progressing um, and the fact that things will ultimately get worse. So what are your suggestions about approaching these conversations with resistant family members in a way that is persuasive and productive? Um, and Dr. Harvath, I'll, I'll let you answer first and then anyone else who wants to chime in on that one. Yeah, this is a, a great question and a, a common area of dilemma and a common area of conflict uh, among families, siblings, parents, uh, not agreeing whether we should talk about it. Um, and, and, you know, I come from the perspective that I think the more we talk about it, the easier it is that, I, you know, others have said, and also that sometimes again, easing into the conversation. So if we don't say, well, what happens, you know, if you're end stage Alzheimer's disease and you no longer know who you are or where you are, none of us wanna imagine ourselves in that situation. And in, instead broaching the subject by, what are the things in your life that are really important to you that you hope to be able to continue to do over time? And then as you start to understand that, you can start probing and saying, well, you know, what if your mobility starts to interfere with, with this? So that it's not all focused on cognition, because that's the scariest piece for all of us with aging. It's the, the thought that we are going to lose our ability to think and reason is the biggest fear we that we all have with aging. And um, and so starting it with things that are gentler <laughs> and then easing in when there's resistance, because you don't want to, you know, I, I, no good comes of fighting against a wall of resistance. It just, you know, people dig in more firmly and instead, you know, go around, perhaps talk about your own, you know, I thought about this for me. This is what, you know, I would want for me. We're, we're always <laughs> hello hello it's so nice to see you <laughs> what a lovely surprise <laughs> uh, Dr. Harbath, let me let me ask you real quickly um what if that resists what if the dementia is already progressing and the conversation is not with the person with the cognitive impairment but with the other a um, be in denial about this and and needing to plan. Yes, that that's uh, another you know all too common dynamic because um, we we don't necessarily all have access to the same information. So um, family members who are either living with the person with dementia or seeing them on a more frequent basis may have much greater insight into the depth of the cognitive impairment, and those who are only seeing um, the person occasionally when they're at their best, when the social skills kick in and they look like they're perfectly fine, they can see a very different picture and, and draw different conclusions. And so sometimes asking for a family conference with the healthcare team, I was just in a family conference uh, this week with siblings who all have very different ideas about what's going on with their mother. And it's important that we recognize that each of us get to the place of insight and understanding probably on a different timeline and allowing for that while gently exposing to more information about what's going on is helpful because again, you know, the, the families in the, documentary 
got to go there very quickly, 30 years in the space of a very short period of time. The rest of us are getting there much more on a much more incremental, insidious basis. And we have to have enough information that we can start to see things for ourselves. And forcing somebody to see something, I always think of denial as bubble wrap. It's protecting something very fragile. And you don't want somebody to live in bubble wrap, but you also don't want to just, you know, what we want to do is we, when we handle bubble wrap, we want to pop it. And we have to recognize that what we're revealing is probably very fragile underneath. Abe, I'm curious, do you any, um, could you offer any suggestions to this individual um, since you, you've been going through this with Carmen as to how to discuss it in a way that is constructive and um, persuasive so that there's no tension and argument among family members? Um, I, I think um, they just have to experience it and see, you know, uh, what's going on in the household. Because um, we had one family member, uh, he was, I'll, I'll just mention, he was Carmen's son. And, you know, because he knew her growing up as a strong woman and, you know, took care of the family and stuff because she was the single mom. But uh, until, you know, we were able to show him that, you know, this is mom and right uh, before and this is mom now, um, he didn't really experience that. And with that interaction with her and just asking questions and just noticing some subtle differences in the way she would, uh, you know, act or ask several questions, like repeated questions, and he kind of noticed that, you know, hey, there's something different about her. But it's been almost a couple of years now. So he's seen that and he's kind of accepted that, okay, uh, you know what, uh, we have to be all on the same page. So it's, it's only now that uh, I've seen the whole family kind of working together just to ensure that mom's going to be, you know, taken care of. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the burden was on me for a long time because, you know, my, my wife and I, but... Uh, now they're just, there's a bunch of other family that's that's actually helping. And like I said, you know, the network that we were aware of that's uh, also supporting us. Thank you for that. Um, we we have a, a viewer that is um, wishing that as a university, there would be a way that UC Davis could actually engage students um, to be exposed to intergenerational intergenerational. Um, spark conversations with their own family members. Again, that conversation. Um, and then um, would we consider pursuing becoming part of the age-friendly university global network through the GSA? I'm unfamiliar with that, but I'll plant that bug with you, uh, Dr. Harvath. And the Academy for Gerontology in Higher Education, which is another um, interesting one. Um, I'm curious, Michael, Eric, from your perspective um, and with the MIT age suit, have they put much younger people in that age suit or how can someone get to test drive that baby? Um, well, the, uh, I suppose as part of our production, the youngest person that would have put it on would have been in, in their early thirties. I had, I did have an idea at one point to get it onto if there were grandkids in one of the families, um, but it is just not sized right. And I just thought it would have been a really very fun uh, experience, experiment, probably would have yielded some really great conversation to have, you know, if you could put it, put it on a, a, a 12 year old or a or 14 year old or something um, and really get a true intergenerational perspectives on, uh, on Agnes. But, um, it was fascinating how differently the children in the film and then their parents reacted with Agnes because of that proximity to, uh, to their futures as older adults. It was much more novel for the children and they were thinking much more of their parents and their grandparents, whereas, and I'm speaking for you here, Abe, but I think we see it in the film, you know, the people who are in their 50s and, and 60s and late 60s, uh, it, it's, um, they're, they're closer to this period of time. And so there was a uh, greater uh, dramatic gravity there. I think also it taps into that, um, that emotion of empathy. And that's something um, they quickly, everyone who put on that suit 
quickly had empathy for those who are totally. experiencing it. Um, and, and that was an important message that you wanted to get across, right, Michael Eric, this empathy? Ab piece. Absolutely, and, and the suit itself isn't truly an immersive experience because that's not necessarily how everybody is going to feel. It's a tool, as you say, a tool for empathy and a tool to sort of shock the user into how something could feel and the kinds of things that they might feel in the future, but really as a conversation tool and a tool to, to create that empathic bridge uh, because it's, it's so difficult. And, and again, that's why we created the kind of film that we did because it's hard to make that, uh, to create that bridge between younger generations and older generations. How did dignity play into what you chose to show and how you chose to show the the um, the film so that people maintain dignity and age because I don't want to leave on a downer that you know we have been talking about some heavy stuff and the film tackles some heavy stuff but one of my takeaways was how happy a year old um, I'm, I'm blanking on her name who was at the um, the intergenerational cafe she was the happiest person around and so was another woman in the art class just like i don't get sad i don't worry i'm happy so there is a happiness to age um and i think a lot of that is dignity yes well i think that uh both of the people that you mentioned there were people who were empowered by a supportive community and empowered by their own ability to choose how they wanted to be living their lives. Tina talked about um, uh, prior to being uh, at Frida and working there that she felt lost and she felt she, she wasn't, she wasn't her, the bubbly self that we see in the film because she felt she did feel disconnected and it provided a place of connection for her. And um, I think that it is, uh, it, it's, a, it's a key thing that everybody was looking for and everybody was thinking about as they thought about where they might want to be in 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 30 years for the parents or, or for the kids or whatever or what, what have you and um it was also something that was we wanted to feature because it was it was uh difficult to create these uh these immersive scenarios of what might exist and do so with the right tone and with the right approach to also lend, you know, dignity and create visions with with dignity, and not do something that was uh, superficial or something that uh, that perhaps struck struck the wrong tone. So uh, it really was essential. Um, uh, dignity was really essential there for us. And and furthering those stereotypes that Dr. Harvath brought up earlier, those ages Absolutely. stereotypes, Absolutely. right? Well, our time has come to an end. I, I'll say, uh, Michael Eric, we have uh, one person who says that uh, she can see a weekly TV show with people wearing Agnes. <laughs> All right, give me a call. <laughs> Maybe we should pitch that to, to PBS because um, I have a feeling there would be a long wait list for people who are willing to experience it, but not for time. I think that that exercise class looked like it was, it was pretty much uh, exhausting. <laughs> when he was wearing the suit. <laughs> I do. I, I want to thank you all so much for joining us and, and, and sharing your experiences in the film, Abe, and the, the vision and your, the desire behind it. Michael Eric and Dr. Harvath, Dr. Tyler, thank you for showing us what UC Davis Health is doing in the space. The tip of the iceberg in the healthy aging initiative work that's going on behind the scenes that will um, continue to uh, roll out in the weeks and months ahead. Um, I wanna remind you that um, there is a brief survey that the documentary creators would like you to fill out. Uh, you will follow up email from uh, your registration for this event. Please, it takes less than five minutes, but please, if you can click on that link and complete the survey, um, that would be excellent. Um, I'm going to conclude with something that one of the participants left their experience with. It says, with age, rather than being along for the ride, you can choose to drink.
and hopefully you have family and friends on board with you. Well, UC Davis Health will certainly be there and we wish you a happy and healthy future. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.